Hi, welcome. Uh, also, welcome to the people online. Uh, my name is uh, Marjolein Ruig. I'm senior lecturer of the learning community Urban Interaction Design at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. This learning community was established in 2020 with the aim of creating an educational and professional community that promotes the link between research, education and the professional field to stimulate the exchange of knowledge and skills in the field of urban interaction design. But what is urban interaction design? Over the past decades, techn technology has radic radically changed everyday urban life. Now, no one leaves home without a mobile phone. There are portals to the online world of information and social contacts. New technologies are constantly being designed and applied in the city. Governments and tech companies have started collecting all kinds of data about urban life, ranging from air quality to traffic congestion. Now, software can organize city life just as well as the program of urban planners. Designing hybrid urban experiences in a context of major social and societal challenges requires a transdisciplinary approach that involves designing from multiple perspectives simultaneously. Urban interaction design combines product design, interaction design, technological innovation and urban design to create urban experiences in which physical and digital are intimately intertwined. The learning community focus on three themes. The first one is responsive public spaces. These are public spaces that use interacti interactive technologies to adapt to users and situations to enhance the quality of the public domain. The second theme is smart cities. Here we question the design of the smart city. How to design a smart city that goes beyond exploitation but is in service of the citizens' benefits. And the last theme is smart citizens. A smart city exists only by its smart citizens. It's a bottom-up approach in which citizens play an important role in determining agency. Based on these themes, questions arise like how could this newly emerging hybrid city be shaped as a public space, designed around public values? And when I talk about values, I mean values like privacy and transparency, private and collective interests, or think about economic and social values, sustainability. And if we look at the future, how can we give more direction to future use, design, and applications of new technologies in public space so that we can be less surprised by unintended consequences? How can we develop and visualize future scenarios that make experiential what will be critical in possible futures? And of this, with the intent to use those scenarios to fuel the social debate about the quality of public space and city life of the future. The learning community started the Imagining the Unimaginable project in September last year. The main purpose of the project was to explore how speculative design could be used to involve citizen perspectives in the urban planning process for the technologized city of tomorrow. To research this space, the editorial, editorial team created three speculative scenarios and disseminated them in an open call to designers, urban planners, artists, but above all citizens. The call invited them to develop a provocative it's a contraction of provocative and prototype based on one of the three scenarios. In the magazine, you will find the speculative scenarios, the technological trends that informed these futures, and the chosen submissions from the open call. For this evening, we organized a program with speculative thinkers, urban interaction designers, and engaged citizens alike to discuss these topics and explore how we can plan our future better together. After all, 
Our purpose as researchers, educators, designers and citizens is not to just understand our current cities better, but also to be able to shape them from both the requirements of the professional field as well as the needs of society itself. We kindly invite all of you to join our discussion. Enjoy. Thank you, Marilijn. Um, good evening. My name is Jorik Elferink. I'll be moderating this evening. Uh, I'll be probably standing mostly in front of the stage today, uh, leaving the stage to the speakers. Um, but I'm also very curious to know who we have in the space with us here. Um, so we're at the event, Imagine the Unimaginable, uh, which is part of the learning community urban interaction design. So just by a show of hands, how many urban interaction designers are there in the room right now? Only four people. So that's pretty interesting. So all of you probably will learn something about urban interaction design. How many people here are interaction designers? Urban interaction designer, of course, again. Yeah, so I think six people. Urbanists, two. All right, all right. So how many of you are students at the moment? A few of you. Are you all students at the University of Amsterdam Applied Sciences? Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences? No, I see some, yes, you are, yep. great. <laughs> all right, so this space is new to most of you, which is exciting. Um, it's also new to me. I know a fair bit about design, I know a fair bit about the city I live in, but that's about it. Um, so I'm very curious to hear what our speakers here in front uh, will share with us. And we have four speakers today. Uh, I'll name them. So we've got Tessa Steenkamp, Tomo Kehara, Troy Naktegal, Alice Ho. And after the four speakers, we'll have a panel discussion. That's where the four seats on the stage are for. Um, and then uh, Tessa and Alice will be joined by Gabriele Ferry and Zeger Schavenmaker. And we'll uh, end the evening with a short story from storyteller uh, Mitchell Samuel Gordon. So that's roughly our program for today. It will take about one and a half hours. After, uh, during the presentations, we will not have a Q&A. So please keep your questions for during the panel discussion. Um, we want to invite all of you to then partake uh, with questions. Uh, and afterwards, of course, there are some drinks, so if you've got any unanswered questions, we'll all be here. Uh, just come up to us, ask your question, uh, discuss with your yeah, fellow people in the room, um, and let's have a good night. Is everyone okay with that? Can I introduce the first speaker? It's a very, very silent, thank you. It's a silent crowd, you know, like I'm trying to warm it up a bit, but it's quite difficult when everyone's like, yeah, okay, okay. All right, so with that, give some more warm welcome to the speakers. I'll introduce the first speaker, which is Tessa Steenkamp. And Tessa is an urban interaction designer, so we'll kick right off. And I'll just read it here because it's quite a mouthful. <laughs> Having studied both interaction design and urban planning, Tessa calls herself an urban interaction designer. In her talk, she will take us through her efforts of advocating for this new but necessary profession while navigating collaborations with governments, architects, and tech startups. Using her own projects as illustrations, she will reflect on bringing a multidisciplinary view into the real world and the role both speculative design and concrete interventions play in this. And with that, Tessa, I'd like to invite you to the stage. Is mine next? Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Tessa Steenkamp. I do call myself an urban interaction designer and I've, uh, I've done so for a few years and I'm really excited that I'm not the only one. There's a three, at least three others of us here. So. Uh, I actually thought I just came up with this thing but apparently 
it's a it's a um, it's a profession now. Um, I usually start by explaining what urban interaction design is, and I thought I would still. Is it on? Higher? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and I thought I would still start that way. Um, yeah, especially if there's only three of us here. But um, I think it's good to uh, to get Eric and to reflect on what this profession could be, and I'll uh, exchange um, definitions of it. So, ooh, white border. I don't like that as a designer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, <laughs> um, so I see the, the city as a kind of interface between individuals and society. Uh, imagine if everyone in Amsterdam was just standing in an open field, um, no one could find anyone or anything and it would be really hard to organize ourselves and take decisions together. So the shapes that the city provides um, kind of gives yeah, an interface to deal with each other and uh, set up democratic systems. Um, and of course society changes and then the city kind of has to change along. Um, not always at the same pace, uh, really only when we can't really deal with our society within the existing walls anymore, we have to break down some walls. And I really like this example. Um, it's the Vijzelstraat, it's quite close to her. Um, and on the left you see is actually a really narrow street in 1891. Um, and then the cars came uh, and it wasn't big enough, so they broke down the whole block uh, to the north side of the Vijzelstraat uh, to make space for the cars, a new technology. Um, so here you see it in 1972, there's a lot of space for cars. Um, and then you see this uh, new building being constructed, which was the headquarters of Abbey and Omro, big bank. Um, and then here on the right you see the same building, which is now a spaces, because we use space differently and we use offices differently. Um, and we're kind of going back to space for cycling, but just a lot more space. Um, so yeah, the, the society changes and the city kind of follows along, um, along the, these new kinds of interactions that we uh, have amongst each other. But then, for the past 30 years or so, uh, there's been an alternative interface between individuals and society, the internet, you might have heard of it. Um, and this is, um, yeah, it's, it seems like a parallel world in a way. Um, and this is a, an analysis of my LinkedIn profile. Um, and these groups are all, they're all connections uh, that, and then the lines are uh, people that I know that know each other too. So um, you see that, um, there's a group around architecture students from London, that's where I study architecture. Um, there's a group of architects in the Netherlands, there's industrial designers, and then some hobbies that are completely separate from my professional life. Um, and in a way you could see this as virtual neighborhoods in a way, but then not necessarily centered around a location, although sometimes, but more centered around interests. Um, and this way the internet provides a way to organize ourselves and take decisions together and find people, um, which is quite the same as this physical city. Um, and of course they're not parallel worlds, right? They, they interact with each other, the physical and the digital. But what does that look like? I heard Marie-Lyne say the smart city. If you Google that, you get a lot of blue lines and floating icons and um, numbers up in the sky. Um, but that's not reality. This is reality. Um, this is a dark store. You might have heard of it. Um, oh. oh, the font also doesn't fit. So it says two parallel worlds, one human reality. Um, and I think what happens here is we design the physical and the digital completely separate. So we design this app that makes it really easy to um, order your groceries online and it's like A-B tested and made super seamless. But then, of course, this has, this has physical effects um, which have not been designed. This is, this is the front of the store, it's not designed. So this is my plea for um, more urban interaction designers. We have to design from the human experience because it's one experience that you have. Um, and then think of which physical and digital elements make up of that experience. Some more examples, you might recognize them. Okay, 
And then I saw that we're also talking about speculative design tonight. Um, so I figured it would be good to highlight my process a bit. Um, so I have kind of three uh, kinds of projects that I work, about, uh, work on. The first one is uh, research projects. So I look at technologies that we use now and if we continue using them that way as we do now and kind of pull that into the future, what does that mean and what kind of future are we heading for? Then I translate that into scenarios and usually visualize scenarios, pretty images of um, um, alternative futures. So do we like what we're heading for? How, we, how do we want that differently? What kind of scenarios can we come up with? And then the third one is how do we actually bring that back to today? So how can we experiment and kind of diverge from the path that we are on? I'm going to give an example. <laughs> Maybe two, depends on the time. Um, so yeah, this is a project I've been working on for a while. Uh, I think three years ago, two years ago. Um, I started seeing these everywhere. This is a scan car. Um, I'm talking about the left one, actually. Um, and it's used by cities to uh, scan license plates and then hand out fines if necessary. Um, it has 12 cameras in that black box on top. Um, and the reason I put this Google Maps Street View car next to it is because a lot of people think that is what it is. Um, but it's not. It gives, it gives fines. Um, and I think it's also interesting to compare the way we communicate what it does. So the Google one really says what it's used for, right? It has an obvious camera. And then it says it's used for street view, and then it has like not really a URL, but kind of you can Google it. Um, and then the scan car from the city just says scan car. Um, you also can't really see the cameras. Um, it doesn't say parking. It doesn't say um, law enforcement or something like that. Um, and that is because it's an object, a static object, in front of a flexible system. Um, so here you see two examples from Rotterdam and Amsterdam. The left one is um, about Rotterdam. There they are testing with uh, using LiDAR uh, for scanning all of public space and then seeing if the lampposts are standing up straight or if they're bent and then um, sending it to the maintenance department, I guess. And the right one is about Amsterdam where the scan car is also experimenting with uh, scanning for waste and then sending a garbage truck to it. And these seem um, harmless extra functions, maybe. Um, but let me go back. If we continue like this and we add functions to it, if I pull it to the future, then maybe in 10 years or so, you don't really know what it's looking for. You just see this car with a black box on top. And you might jump behind a tree if it, walk, if it drives by because you don't know what it's looking for. Um, so a lot of the conversation around these things is about privacy, and I think privacy is a bit of a container term. Um, I think we feel like our privacy is being invaded if we don't actually know if it is invading our privacy. It's a lot of a lot about communication. So I came up with this framework for designing systems differently, um, and I noticed that a lot of projects are now um, becoming more transparent, so opening up their code, opening up their data. But not everyone's a programmer, so how can you take a next step after that? Um, that would be by making the data or the code legible to people, maybe creating a dashboard, but then again, that's still kind of nerdy. So how do you make it relatable? Um, how do we understand what it's actually doing? And then maybe a next step would be how can we make it contestable? So can you actually opt out? Can you say, no, I don't want this to happen here? Um. <laughs> um, and then the next one would be, uh, which for me would be the ideal scenario, is that a system is actionable. We all get to use it. Um, we can maybe um, yeah, tag images on the license plates um, for the, ooh, oh, OK. Um, for the scan car um, or communicate with our neighbors that way because the only way to get to know a system is to use it yourself um, and the only way to take democratic decisions about these kind of systems is if we all understand it. 
So, um, yeah, this was uh, two years ago with a company called UN Sense and the AMS Institute. Uh, we created some speculative future scenarios for alternatives um, far from now. And you see we, we changed the car a bit. So it has these icons on the, the top um, for what it's scanning for, and you can actually see whether it's turned on or off. That's the difference. <laughs> um, and also the sensor itself in its form kind of communicates what it's looking for. So this is the waste sensor. It's on the bottom of the car because why would it need to be on top? It doesn't have to be in your face. It's looking on the street. Um, and you can scan back. There's a QR code. And then you can see what it's actually looking for. And then the actual part is that you can leave messages. So you can say, oh, I found a refrigerator. Maybe the scan car can pick it up, but maybe someone else would like to have it. Maybe it can become like a trade platform. Or um, can the scan car kind of be a friendly neighbor in a way? Because now they all look the same, so you have no idea if there's like three or if it's an anonymous army of 100. <laughs> you don't know. Um, what if they get names and maybe a phone number? And uh, you can text and ask questions and like say, um, hey, can you check if my daughter is still in the playground around the corner? Um, yeah. So this was a while ago. Um, and now, actually, I, I presented this um, for a group like this. And then the elder man of um, Den Bosch was in the room. And he was like, oh no, I just bought one. <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> um, so now I'm actually really diving into this process, which brings me to the third step of the approach that I showed, uh, experimenting. And um, it's been really interesting to see, I'm, I'm still in it, so there's no experiment yet, um, but it's really interesting to see how this robot, in a way, changes the work of the law enforcement. Uh, they kind of become a slave to the machine. Um, they help grow the technology, and it could also be the other way around. Like, the technology could help them grow, but it's, it's not the case. It also kind of um, um, takes away ownership over a street. So before, people could see which car had paid and which one had not, and they could actually leave a note themselves, and as a community, act upon this, but now it's all invisible. So I think that's where I might be heading with the experiment, but let's see. Um, I'm skipping the next example. Kind of thought I would have to, but put it in there anyway. Um, that was my talk. If you want to see the experiment, um, keep an eye on my website. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going straight into the next presentation. I'm welcoming to the stage Tomo Kihara. He's an artist, designer, and developer. And Tomo will be talking about Future Collide a citizen-led participatory project that uses fictional signs and billboards in artificial reality as a starting point for playful collaborative speculation on the future of cities. Thank you, Vinic. Thank you for the introduction. There was a typo that I made. Uh, it's not Future Collide, but it's actually Future Collider. So <laughs> if you're able to Google that, please Google that. Um, so, yeah, so my name is Tom Kara and Today I want to talk about the project I'm doing called Future Collider, which I think is at this intersection uh, between urban interaction design and speculative design. And uh, allow me to introduce myself. Like uh, I, I'm one of those people who are um, always like have struggle trying to explain what I am. Like because some people say, "Oh, you're an engineer because you code things." Some people say, "Oh, you're a game designer because you make games." And like I, I just like don't really. And at this point, I just say, like, I design and code critical toys, which is what I do as my practice. And when I say critical toys, um, I don't mean, like, toys in a literal sense. I mean toys in a broader sense that engages people in play and make them, like, leave with a critical aftertaste that provides, like, a new ways of looking at a certain kind of social problem or like provide like kind of empowers them in a different way. So to maybe give some example of the critical toys that I have been working on in this field of urban interaction design. So one project on the top uh, over there, you see the street debate project. Um, it uses a scale that uh, asks two questions, which 
you can ask, which asks the passerby to vote with their own coins. And in this case, it's asking basic income, yes or no. And people are like kind of voting coins on it. And this scale is actually um, done this uh, a two way to create, like facilitate debate on the street. And it's actually done by people who live on the streets and is a way for them to um, earn money and also create discussion without having them to go through this process of like begging. And on the, on the bottom, there's another project that uh, I was doing in this theme of cities, which was Escape the Smart City, which is an escape room that takes place in the city of Amsterdam, where the players have to escape from this really advanced surveillance system that tracks your face and is, knows like your credit score. And, at a, and yeah, it's, it was this really weird uh, big project and yeah, I won't spoil details because I plan to kind of host this one soonish. But if you're interested, um, you know, it's very cool. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of projects I do. And I really like um, designing and coding these like playful interfaces that provoke and ask these questions. And for the, the future Collider project, what, is, what this is is that um, it is a form of play, but it's much more on this theme of how can we build better futures together as, as a citizen and a collective. And it is, it's, it's a citizen-led participatory project and that allows like, people to come up with their own version like what they want the city to be and make signs of it and then place them, place them in the actual space. So um, can you tell like, which one part of this sign is in AR? Maybe it's obvious, probably. Um, the bottom one, yes. Because um, this, this sign was like, made by, like, in a, by a friend who lives in Rotterdam. And this also created, spark, created a lot of debate. Because you know, some people have experienced, probably a lot of people here have experience of their bike being stolen. And he was, like, he was at this point where like, I don't really care about privacy. I just really want to care that my bike is not stolen. And he kind of made that sign, which was kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, that's like, it was really cool to kind of, it's a tool that allows to facilitate conversations like that. And which, uh, this, uh, this is one, this is fresh out of the oven. You might have seen this place. Um, <laughs> but what I like about this science in general is that just by placing it, it creates an entire different context and scenario. So having a sign that says like no drone surveillance in the middle of Amsterdam kind of tells the society where Either it is like too unsafe for people to kind of go about without drone surveillances, or the drone surveillances have become too common, where and now that like people have to find, kind of find like an escape space that like they can evade, evade these surveillances. Um, so I really like the effect of how like such a single item can provide, and yeah, it's also cool to see like how people come up with different signs all over the world. Um, you have this sign of no euro accepted, a Chinese place where it only takes cryptos, which is kind of disturbing. And also, like, obviously signs of a huge fraud, which can be placed, like, anywhere. And I guess, like, what fascinates me is um, the motivation for, for this project, I guess, started uh, two years ago, like, just during the pandemic, when I just saw this signs, this new signs popping up everywhere. And it made me realize like, how we are kind of living in this time where um, changes that were thought unimaginable could happen like, in a moment's notice. And I feel like these fictional signs can be a good scaffold for, to allow people to think of the, the other alternatives that most people think are outside the box. And I also think it's a really good way I think signs are a good way, or signs or things in the street are a good way for people to understand about cultures they never experienced in. So this is a picture I just posted like four, three days ago. And apparently this is, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is like a trash bin for cyclists, right? And I thought this was the most Dutchest thing. And like, it's, I shared this with my friends and they, they were fascinated. They were like, oh, do the Dutch people commute by bicycles? And they sold their like, breakfast in there? And they were like, yeah, that's, I think that's, that's, how, that's how this works, right? 
And just, just showing that tells a lot about the culture. And, I, and it, thinking about that alone, I think it's quite interesting as an exercise. And also, like, I feel signages and like, maybe advertisement, they have this element to it that captures our, our desires in a really nice way. So I travel to a lot of cities, but like, anywhere I go, I always see a sign that promotes beer. Like, that's kind of like everywhere because people want to get drunk. And also, it's interesting is like it has been that way for like around like 200 years, right? So you have a painting from like uh, 70, some, like uh, 70, uh, 38, where it depicts like um, fire, but on the background you see like a billboard of like uh, it, probably like ale or pub, and you can see how like universal this thing is, and it's not just desires, right? It also portrays some kind of societal restrictions, and which is also unique about the culture. And this sign is uh, no smoking weed in a public sign, which I also think is very Dutch. Like, you would never see this anywhere in East Asia, like, because, you know, having weed would get you in jail. So <laughs> that's, this is also, like, um, super unique that I like. And also the absence of, of these signs can tell a lot about, like, certain cultures. So, for instance, like, this is a screenshot from The Independent um, depicting how the local people in Kabul had to um, paint over like billboards depicting women since like the, because the Taliban took over. So I feel like there's elements to this that I've, that's kind of fascinates me. And also the other part is how some of the signs like that are in other places are actually like portraying some sort of future. So this is like the signs that I saw like um, two years ago in South Africa which it depicted the, like a drought and like there's no water anymore. And yeah, if you place that in Amsterdam, that's going to be a very like dystopian thing. Um, okay, I need to skip. Uh, I will probably skip this, but this is a, uh, I'll skip this. This is a diagram, yeah, I'll skip this. So yeah, just quickly going through like um, how this whole process of like uh, the future quality that works is we have this process of like field research first like scanning the existing signs and then like extrapolating on what could that be or what the, the non-existing of, of that could be and then share ideas together around like what could, what could be and then come up with ideas and then like in the end um, you, you or actually I uh, have to prototype that sign in front of everybody and try to make it within a short time and then people go outside to actually deploy them and share that share the story of like what that sign is and like how that sign was created. So that's like how this whole process works. And it's really interesting to see, I guess like um, people not just taking videos but also enacting to the, the taking videos. So there were people like enacting a story where they see a non uh, a sign that says like no plastic allowed and they just like hide their plastic bags. And all those is like really possible because of like this tool. And yeah, so at the, so, and also I, what I find is really interesting is how diff, uniquely different like uh, each sign outcome is. So in Amsterdam when we did it, the out, outcome was like a no plastic stone sign, which was very uh, like reflecting of like kind of values there. And in Japan, like, when we did it, like, nobody really cared about, like, um, <laughs> in a good way, I guess, I, um, about, like, privacy or, like, sustainability. Uh, what the sign that came out was a um, sign called Banning Forbidden. It was made from this girl who hated um, signs in Japan where, like, it forbid her from playing playing outside, so she was like, yeah, I, I want to like kill all these signs, and we actually made that, <laughs> which was really fun. Um, so yeah, that's the, so it, it, I really like how like it's really bottom up, and I guess like the most important part of this, and what I'm trying to do is that like most speculative design projects tends to be very um, designer driven. It's this like really smart RT person with a PhD coming up, which is really cool, complicated scenario, and then like, you know, you, you being involved in it. And I kind of want to turn that the other way around where like it's the actual like everyday citizens coming up with like cool ideas or like the features they don't want and then turning that into reality. So that's like the more futures 
that I feel I want like this tool to create. So yeah, that's the it's uh, a pre presentation of the feature quieter and advertisement time. Um, <laughs> On May 5th, uh, we, we are also going to do a future Collider workshop in Amsterdam at the VAG. At the VAG. So if you're interested, um, yeah, let me know I, and I can book you up. And you can access the web app Future Collider from that QR code over there. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I am on. Thank you, Tomo. That was very nice. Also, great capturing me outside arriving here and putting it in your slides. Um, our next speaker is Troy Nactigo. Um He's professor, professor of Fashion Technology at Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. And he will talk about the following. Computational design is changing how we make cities and fashion, for example, shoes. Now that both make and may, are made from data, what can cities tell us about shoe design and shoes about city design? How could we use ideas like multimodal mobility and see shoes as closing the last mile? How do smart cities change the way we make and use shoes? Troy. Thanks. So it mixed up my thoughts as well, but I kind of like it, so I'm going to run with it. Um, I want to talk to you about my favorite thing tonight, and it's the thing we use to interface with the city every single day, and that's shoes. Uh, they are a direct interface to what we're doing and where we're at. And I don't have a clicker, so I'm just going to... There should be a clicker. Oh, there's a clicker. Thanks. Oh. Perfect. Um, yeah, so this font thing's going to be interesting, but we're just going to run with it. Um, I sent a PDF, but that's okay. <laughs> um, it's fine. So I am really obsessed with how we use data to make things, and it's been a really interesting experience to look at how can we you know, be one part designer, one part programmer, and flirt with interaction design quite a lot to figure out what this is going to look like in the future when every piece of data we make can actually do something positive for us in our lives, make things for us that understand the context and the situation that we live in, and really situate the designed objects around us to be for us in the place where we live and we use these things on our everyday basis. Great. That's awesome. <laughs> Making data. <laughs> if we'd only solve that with shoes. So I'm really obsessed with changing the idea of what fashion is. And so I really claim anything that is technology that's on the body, whether that technology is the knitting or the weaving that makes the clothes that you're wearing, or the devices in your pocket that you're not currently using actively in your hand. The moment you put your phone in your pocket, it becomes mine, because we all know it's still generating data and doing all kinds of crazy stuff with where you're at and what you're doing. And I really think that we have to use that to start making things that are better for the world and better for us. This is a t uh, picture by Tony Dijak, and I think it's just one of the best pictures out there in terms of mobility and people moving. Uh, this is a girl in the Amish culture, and she's not allowed to own a bike, uh, but she can certainly wear these awesome flip-flops and have this amazing hot pink step bike. And you can see she's got LEDs in the back of it, but religiously she still has to wear the blue dress and the white bonnet. And I just think it's one of those amazing things of how do we get around and how do we get around the places where we live that really defined who we are and what we're doing. And that wasn't the button to push. So I, I don't, um, in terms of it, relating this back to interaction design, I, I, these are not all my ideas. I had some very wonderful people in my PhD program who were architects and interior designers working on very different scales than me. And it was sitting there talking to these architects and really figuring out what happens when we start to blend fashion design and the city and architecture all together. What could be the future that comes out of that? And so one of my favorite projects I got a chance to take a look at from the inside was the Smart Cities project that's going on with Signify, also known as Philips Lighting, when it was starting. And uh, they're selling lights to cities, and they're putting lights everywhere, but these lights are not just lights. If you know the Hue project, and you know Alexa, these lights have all kinds of sensor packages inside of them. So you can imagine the lights that are lighting up your city are also listening to everything that you're doing, and they're using AI to track everybody. And they don't even need cameras, because with the microphones, they know what's going on. They know where the traffic is. They know the sounds that are going on around you. They know how many pigeons live in your neighborhood. They know pretty, pretty much what's going on 
there without even having to attach a camera to it. They do a little bit of humidity and temperature data and they've got everything that's going on in that neighborhood from a very interesting perspective. And they're very positive about it and you can go watch this video about how cool they think it is and, and what's happening there. I see it as a great source for data though. We're starting to understand what's happening in our cities, exactly every place in those cities and who does what where and how do we change those cities based upon what we're seeing in actuality. What is the situated reality of it? Not just the storefronts, not just what the people with money decide is going to be put in a specific place. They're starting to see what actually happens in those cities. And that gives us some really interesting opportunities to start making stuff. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Um, everybody knows Google. You not only has it in cars, they also have it in phones. And they use the street view to figure out the world around you, right? Um, so navigating through Brussels here. Now, one of the interesting things about Google that we know about is that every time you open and close Google Maps, what does it do? It takes a picture. And it's, what are they doing with that pictures? Well, the picture on the left is what I think Google's doing with it. They're trying to figure out the texture. They're trying to get better mapping of the city. But my question is, what about the right? What else is in that picture when it's pointing down at the street? Your shoes are there. And I think that that's really interesting. Google knows every pair of shoes you own and when you wear them and where you wear them. And I think we could do something really fun and interesting with that because the shoes you're wearing probably give us some idea about what are you doing today? You know, what kind of activities are you engaged in? Are you going someplace nice? Are you, do you have your dress shoes on? Are you wearing your sneakers? You know, we already know how many steps you're taking in a day and all that's in your personal data, but what shoes are you actually having on? And we all open up Google Maps at least once a day, I suspect, probably. So what are all the data sources that are actually important to us? What's all the data that we actually need to know about somebody to start making things for them? And that's where I think it's really interesting where we start taking your personal data and start mixing it with the city data and we come up with some really interesting new ways to start talking about transportation and urban in the city. So we get the where, are you, where do you live and what's going on there. We get the reminders of everything you're supposed to be doing today. They already have a pretty good idea about what you're supposed to be doing. They already know what you're doing. They know what shoes you're wearing, which is the important part. Um, they know how many steps you usually take in a day. They know how many steps you probably should take in a day and they're trying to change those behaviors. We, we see our behavior designers going really close to that. But they also know other values about you, like your kids and what's important to you and, and, and what are you posting to Instagram can tell you a hell of a lot about what a person values and what their personal values are. So how can we change that to affect our modality, our mobility? What are the modes of travel that we're using? Multi-modal uh, mobility. So, Apps like 9292 are my favorite. It's something that they don't have in the rest of the world, and I really wish they did because they do an amazing job at it. What I love about 9292 is they've got a really great understanding of all the different modes of transportation you could take. They understand that you can take a bike or you can rent a bike. They understand all these things. What they, what they don't seem to understand or they take for granted because they didn't make an icon for it is the shoe. There's no shoe in there. They don't understand where am I walking? How am I getting for that last little part? How am I getting to the bike? And how am I getting from the bike to where I'm going? So, you know, where's the shoe? And even Google, you know, they have lots of fun things here. I can ride my bike, I can call a cab, I can maybe hike, but there's no shoes involved. You know, it's funny how every other mode of transportation has an icon except for shoes. So one of my favorite projects also comes from uh, Danon, what's her last name? Ah, I forget her first name. Anyway, she's just got, she came up with this really great project called Work Walk. So in the Work Walk, uh, what they're trying to do is trying to understand where can we walk? How can we walk more? What activities can we do while walking? And so what I really love about this project is she's trying to invent ways of actually taking notes while you walk. You can have work meetings that you're out walking instead of sitting around horrible tables and terrible buildings for hours endlessly uh, all day long. So what does that mean? It means we need more shoes. <laughs> and so we have this idea that these shoes are going to take us around to all the meetings that we're going at. The shoes are still the interface for the city. It's just an example of how do we add more activity to the shoes. So what I love about multimodal mobility is this. Sometimes we don't, we don't need to park as close as we can on our bike to things. Sometimes we need that 15 minutes to understand where we're going to take a conversation. Sometimes we need to park a little bit further away so that we have time to get other things done. But we're starting to have the data that really allows us to understand, okay, this is a quiet neighborhood. This is where there's no sound. If you get off your bike 
five minutes earlier and walk this, you're gonna get the number of steps you need to get in today to stay healthy and to be a good person that, uh, that, that has these things. It's gonna give you those five minutes to call your kid and say hi, and, and it can really start building in those. And as our systems become more intelligent, it gets to be really interesting to understand how do we build in those moments? How do we add that friction to our design and design only moments to make things and make that better? At the same time, we get all this data to make shoes. Now this is a pair of shoes made by some of my students with a make your own shoe kit that I made. And what I love about it is that they made it with code on an embroidery machine. So it's entirely embroidered. I just bought some shoe soles and made a little kit to help them put it together. How can we start taking the data that's around us and making things with it? And what I really love when they start doing that is they start understanding the data that's being generated around them. So uh, this is a fake website for a company called Victoria. It has nothing to do with Nike, obviously. Um, but it's asking, what can I do? How, how can we make shoes? And how can I use the specific data that's inside those shoes? So this is a ResNet 50 algorithm that we have an app that my, uh, my Applied AI students made that will really tell you what style you're wearing. Look at the app, it says, ah, you're wearing this style. But what we're really enjoying is the fact that we can make it very obvious. Which outfits are you wearing and which outfits did the, or did the AI key in on? So how can we actually take a look at your personal style, take a look at where you're walking, take a look at all that other data, and generate the shoe that's perfect for you, for your psychology, for your sociology, for who you are, where you go, and what you do in your average day. And you know, not just your average day, but all the days of your life. What are your dress shoes? What are your uh, fun shoes? How does it all come together? We're looking at your wardrobe of shoes. This was my first attempt at it as a coder, to actually write 3D code, or code that drives 3D printers and allows us to make shoes with laser cutters and 3D printers and to entirely make a shoe that's digitally fabricated. Uh, and it's, it just shows that it's possible. We can hook the AI up to this. We can start to understand how AI works by looking and making things with that AI, using that data to make it explicit and show us what that data is actually being used for, instead of having these data just be crazy stuff up in the cloud that we don't know what they're doing with our data. And it's pretty crazy what they're doing with that data. So we should start seeing it in our daily lives and trying to figure out what we're doing with it. Started with a high heel, which was the craziest way to go about this, but you can 3D print a high heel, you can do just about anything with this kind of data. So I'm gonna leave you with three things. Fashion is a technology that envelops the body. Fashion is just your interface. It's this thing that's interfacing with your city, it's interfacing with the people around you. Fashion is made and worn with data as a material. We make fashion with data and we always have. If you look at weaving machines and you look at knitting machines, we've been using data for about 16,000 years to use materials and data to bring things together to wrap around your body. And finally, fashion is the craftsmanship of wearing clothing. I'm really obsessed with how you get dressed every day and where you take your shoes out into the city and what you do with that. So that's great. Uh, keep wearing shoes, keep letting me know what you're doing with them, and uh, let's, uh, let's hope we start doing some interesting things with the data that we're generating. Thank you, Troy. Then for our last speaker of the evening, I have to enter my code now. Yes, it's Alice Ho, and she is an architect, urban designer, and strategist. What is speculative design for? And how might it move from paper into driving the social and ecological systems change we so urgently need to see? From the art world to the EU policy, Alice will give a whistle-stop tour of the way she has applied speculative design throughout her career in architecture and urbanism. Where's yours? Thank you very much. Yes, hi everyone, really nice to be here in person. Um, oh, yeah, this is me. Uh, so I start with my career in a fun graphic, because I thought this would speak to this particular crowd. <laughs> um, and all it is to say is that I'm trained as an architect, so technically on the design side, but throughout the time in practice, I've been kind of crossing over to the speculative side. Um, for instance, I started a think tank called In Between Economies where we speculated on the future of cities and held public discussions a bit like this in Copenhagen. 
Um, I was part of a futures team at UN Studio, a big architecture practice here in Amsterdam, where we did scenario building with clients who had a question about what they wanted to build. Um, and I've landed at Laudes Foundation, which is a philanthropy focused on the dual crisis of social inequality and climate change. So I've gone from the job title of futurist to program manager, <laughs> but I like to think that I'm still doing speculative design, so I want to kind of show you how. And before I move on to the next slide, and because I'm the last speaker and it's 9 p.m. the night after King's Day, I thought I'd just check if everyone is awake and ask if you could shout out what's the first name that comes to mind when you think of speculative design. Someone. Thank you. That's, right. That's the right answer. <laughs> I'll pay you after. <laughs> exactly. So this is the kind of classic speculative design duo, right? We have Dunn and Raby, who since the early 2000s have been designing interesting uh, uh, artifacts to um, critique, debate, and speculate. And, that, and that's great, and it's super interesting what they do, but I want to kind of provoke a discussion tonight to see if speculative design might do more than that. Like, can we go beyond speculating and provoking to actually making things happen or change in the world? And so my next slide, I think, might be a little bit unpopular with my fellow panelists, but I'm going to show it anyway, which is a kind of critique that speculative des design, to be honest, quite often gets, which is that it stays within a relatively niche world, um, people do futures conferences, we, we hold discussions like this, but actually it hasn't really managed to bridge into uh, uh, the mainstream. So I'd like to kind of mm -hmm. suggest that it could do. Because actually I don't agree with this at all. I think speculative design is all around us today. We have here Ursula stating that the EU is going to be the world's first climate neutral continent. And what is this if not speculative design? Because the truth is that we have absolutely no idea how we're going to get there. She's not, the, uh, she's not the only one either, so Copenhagen is the, the city who said the earliest that it will be a climate neutral city, but of course every major city we can think of now has made the same pledge. Even petro states like Saudi Arabia are saying they're going to be uh, fossil free by 2060, so everyone around the world is using speculative design today. And to dive a little bit into how we're doing this, this is one of the EU's key roadmaps for how it's going to use technology to achieve this. Um, and this is the kind of emblematic graph of our time, right? This is how we're going to reduce emissions by 2050. We know every single sector here has to radically come down. How are we going to do that? It's still a huge open question. Um, this one I, I really like because it's about a scaling up of technology and what's quite interesting, this is core EU policy, right? You see that um, innovation bets is one of the main things that we're going for. So this is kind of EU taxpayers' money being spent on innovation bets. It's speculative design at its best. And what I find pretty interesting, it's talking about technology readiness levels, very geeky, but it says mass deployment of such niche technologies must be achieved by 2030 plus. Again, these are niche technologies, we have no idea if they're going to work, but they must be achieved within 10 years or we fail the climate. So what I believe is that thanks to climate change, actually speculative design has become the de facto mode of governance today. This is literally how we're planning our lives. Uh, and to no small value also, this is um, the European Union's Horizon Europe program, and that's 1.2 billion euros of taxpayers' money going towards uh, policy by speculative design. And what you see is it's not only um, conceptual, it's not only about uh, 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 bringing, us, bringing new technologies to market, but they're using Mariana Mazzucato's amazing missions process to kind of set very high level missions and then try to achieve them by kind of bringing together different sectors. So there's a process there for speculative design, but it definitely is that. Mm, this one I really like, I'm sorry it's the last graph so I'll stop boring you, but um, basically what I want to say is that in mitigation measures, so the measures we need to take to mitigate climate change, the biggest chunk here, the red chunk, is CCUS, that's carbon capture, utilization, and storage. These are technologies that we don't have yet today. You can see currently it's in prototype mode. We need to get it from demonstration to market uptake to mature in 10 years. So this is kind of like design school language, right? We're prototyping, it's, it's uh, at the core of policy today. 
And what's interesting about this particular technology is that we don't actually have it yet, and yet all of our uh, uh, policies for the climate are based on scaling up carbon capture. So what I'd like to point out is that there are basically no ways that we're going to get to net zero without using a technology that doesn't yet exist. So this is speculative design. We're all betting on it. We're all in it together. So I see this kind of moving from the art world to the policy world, and I'd like to show some examples also of how I've been working on that. Mm, yeah, so this is to kind of bring it back to the framing, which is looking at citizens' perspectives and um, urban futures. And this is an example from some of my students at the Garrett Rietveld Academy, so sitting quite firmly in the art world, but it's kind of critiquing the relationship between nature, humans, and technology in the future. And what I really like about Vimka's project is that she's made this kind of strange data center to attach to Flora Holland Alsmere, mm, where she's saying in the future, maybe we're going to need to study plants. Maybe we're going to need to kind of analyze data about plants because we don't have them anymore or we don't have as many uh, species. Mm. Similar to Herman's project, this was a kind of hyperloop for plants, so how can extinct species be brought around the world in the future so that we can all experience them when they've kind of disappeared from the natural world. Mm, this is a project I worked on with uh, UN Studio, which was a hyperloop for people, <laughs> with the Dutch hyperloop company Hart. Mm, this was a really interesting one, looking at the future of red light district in Den Haag. Um, and we actually interviewed a lot of sex workers in this area. It was a process I'd never been through before. And what we discovered was that although um, technology is meaning that most sex work is actually uh, augment not augmented, but uh, instigated online today through phones, um, what the sex workers would prefer is to actually keep to windows because it's safer and you have a community and you see each other and know each other. So actually what we came up with for 2050 looks pretty much like it does today. Uh, this was a project I did with the think tank in between economies where we designed a sort of infrastructure for people to be able to develop and own their own housing together, a sort of mass distributed cooperative based on platform technology. Um, and this was a project with Space and Matter, Neighborhood OS, where we designed uh, a, a, a platform based tool for cooperative groups to actually design their own neighborhoods based on circular principles. This contained within it a kind of material flow analysis, which is a way of understanding inputs and outputs into a, actually anything, but in this case, a neighborhood. So how can you speculatively design material flows in the future in order to make an urban plan sustainable? So maybe what you see is that I'm kind of really interested in these bottom layers, these infrastructural layers um, below or behind what you see on the surface, which is things or objects. And this is where I'm trying to bring speculative design into kind of regulations, finance, ownership. Uh, and now at Lauder's Foundation, to, to finish off, I just show these last two projects. Um, this is with the Institute for Human Rights and Business, where we're enabling them to develop a narrative for just transition. So what, what does a city in 2050, which has made the climate transition but done it in a socially just way, what does that look like? And they're doing a series of citizen assemblies with residents and workers to determine that from the bottom up. Um, and this one, which I find amazing, this is the, the federal level uh, of national unions in construction and woodwork. So it's called Building and Woodworkers International. And this is them gathering online during COVID, of course. Um, and we're enabling them to kind of do a speculative design of how climate change is going to affect their industry, so jobs in construction uh, and woodwork, and actually figure out um, what that means for them from the worker perspective and think about what they're going to need to do, you know, reskill, potentially move to another place and how to kind of um, uh, drive that narrative from the worker's perspective rather than what we usually get, which is government saying we're going to create X amount more jobs or uh, we're going to stimulate this industry or policy think tanks kind of saying what the future of work is. And when I Actually, when I was putting together this presentation, I didn't know about this before, but I noticed that they've even created their own application for 
um, supporting workers in their workplace to report on labor conditions. So this is kind of next generation unionism where they're able to use platform technology to actually share and communicate what's going on in the workplace. So we thought that was a nice place to end. So let's, ex oh, so let's, expand, let's expand our definition of speculative design to make it more relevant for the future. That's my pledge. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation part of this evening, uh, and we'll move into the panel discussion. So hopefully you've listened to all the presentations and maybe you've got some questions. Uh, this is the time that we'll be wanting them. So let me invite to the stage. Um, I'm going to ask you to come back, Alice. <laughs> you just sat down. Uh, we've got some water here as well. Uh, and Tessa, uh, they uh, don't need an extra introduction. But joining them will be Gabriele Ferri and Zeger Schavenmaker. And yeah, you can please join us already, take your spot. Uh, and Gabriele is a design researcher at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Uh, his research practice is at the crossroads of critical design, community initiatives, and playfulness. His speculative games use, among others, furry robots, time travelers, and alpacas as props for engaging people from all walks of life to imagine desirable and undesirable futures. He directs the Master of Digital Design at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, where he has taught design futures and design ethics. He is concerned about the future of our cities and occasionally his own. Gabriel. And Zeger, uh, he's the future mobility designer at the Municipality of Amsterdam, uh, innovation manager and expert advisor at the Traffic Management Department. He's initiating and developing new visions and strategies for Amsterdam, such as, mobility center of, uh, such as the Mobility Center of the Future and Innovation Center for Digital Mobility Management. Zeger. So I'll kick off the panel discussion with a question, but please uh, join in, raise your hands, and we'll uh, give yeah, someone a word. Otherwise, we'll just keep the conversation going. I'll keep, have some questions. And starting with all of this, I've been listening to all the presentations, and it's all, indeed, future. It's unimaginable. It's speculative. But how do we then transfer from starting to use that and applying that? And I don't know who would like to just kick off. I would say maybe Zeger from the uh, municipality, like listening to these presentations, uh, the work that you do yourself. Um, how does this sort of translate to your day to day? Well, I really like the example Tessa gave from the Vijsselgracht. Um, and I always start my presentations with why did we want this breakdown of the Vijsselgracht? And maybe it's also fun for you to check YouTube. Uh, there's a fun video of the Futurama. Uh, it was Norman Belgeddes, an industrial designer, who designed our cities nowadays. He developed cities with highways, seven lanes. It was really important. Uh, and it was the rise of the car. It was sponsored by Shell General Motors. Uh, and it made also our vision of the city that we want. Uh, and that's why we break down this Weisselgracht and now it's, uh, we have a lot of space for cars in the city. Uh, and I always question, uh, what is the city where, that we want? Is this a city we're still aiming for? Is it still, we want to optimize it, more efficient, more f f even... Uh, I sometimes see myself, I see a scenario like the future city is one big distribution center and everything is important with time to delivery. Is that the city we want? Or do we aim for other cities? And I try to, for example, put the donut economics perspective on mobility. And how can we make a mobility more social system? Uh, how can we be uh, limited also with the, our ecological ceiling? And I think that's why uh, imagination is really important. So can we make futures that we really desire for instead of their happen to us? 
And I think that's really interesting. I heard a lot of examples where we can use speculative design to imagine these other futures. Nice. Actually, I would like to bounce this back uh, a little bit. Uh, because I think that there is also some value in actually not uh, applying concretely what we, what we speculate about, right? Uh, and I think what, what I really like about the presentations that we, that we heard so far is that there is really a balanced mix between things that are actually concretely applicable and things that maybe are not. Uh, but I also want to say something positive about the things that are not applicable, uh, because I really believe that part of the power of being speculative is the fact that it somehow loops back uh, to the present and forces us to reflect on what we should be doing or what we should not uh, be doing. Uh, so, so yes, so I'm here to add a plus one on, also on, the, uh, on the things that don't have a concrete, immediate uh, application in, in the near future. We have two. Oh, I didn't realize. Thank you. <laughs> one for the ladies and one for the men. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's a good question. And I think your, you, you two's example of um, cars is interesting because I think the fact is whether we all like it or not, speculative design is being applied um, and often by those who have the most resources to do it, which is often not the groups that are most socially and environmentally aligned. So, for example, with cars... Obviously, General Motors and Ford in the kind of early 20th century were able to have a vision of a world based on cars and literally get it built by lobbying the American government, for example. Um, and we see, it, in addition, our own Shell uh, oil company also able to apply speculative design uh, and scenario planning. Actually, they're like the original scenario planning um, organization. They've been doing it since the 60s. Um, to their own strategy in order to be able to drive the world to use more of their oil. So I think whether we all like it or not, other organizations that are more savvy and have more resources to put towards it have been using it for a long time. And I showed positive examples, you could argue, of the EU using it. But yeah, everyone's doing it and <laughs> we just got to catch up. Nice. I just have a tiny thing to add, because I think you all said really wise things. Um, but I think we should never forget, or at least as designers, never forget about the design part of speculative design. And I think it's um, really important to make these speculations visible and uh, maybe even tangible and test it out so that we, can, um, so that we have something to talk about, because I think it requires a lot of collaboration to get to the future that we want. Um, and it helps to have something tangible on the table for that. Thank you. Is there already a question in the crowd? I'll bring over a microphone. Oh, you can do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentations. I have, I'm new in this field, so for me this is all very new information. My background is in politics. So I was curious about how does politics play into the process of creating this kind of design and this kind of speculation. You're from the municipality, so you're probably working with this as well. And I was wondering how political change, so every four years the color of politics changes, what kind of implications does that have on your research? Who likes to take this? I'll just say one sentence. <laughs> I, I used to work for the city as well, and I noticed that politicians really need the right examples to build their policies on. Um, so as a designer, I think, again, it's important to create the right examples and make it tangible and visible. Uh, again, I'm going to take maybe the more extreme route, but I, I do think that speculative and critical design is political in, in itself, right? Uh, the moment in which we imagine a future that is possible or not possible or desirable or undesirable, we are really squarely in the domain of, of politics. So again, I would like to turn your question on its head and say not, not necessarily what is the influence of politics in the process of speculation, uh, but 
I would love that the process of speculation uh, ends up influencing politics. Actually, building on what you just said, Tessa, that's, that's, that's really wise. Everyone except the person who's actually working with this. <laughs> um, no, I think your point is perfect, and I'd almost like to hear from you, like how you design politics, right? Because to your point, all politics and policy is speculative design because you're proposing something that should happen and, and putting resources towards it. Um, and there's a whole field of uh, sort of futures politics. I don't know if you've come across this, like Wales, for example, um, in the United Kingdom has a futures commissioner. And I know that Japan has a really interesting process of doing sort of deliberative futuring where you have someone in the political space who represents people from the future and has to kind of say, well, that's going to affect me because of climate change and this is going to affect me because of economics or whatever and, and that, that is a sort of I, I think politics is becoming a bit more speculative and also playful in those processes and I'm really uh, hopeful and excited to see where that can go because to your point the kind of four year term can only get us so far I think and is leading to quite some short termism so I think there's a lot of room for uh, exploring other processes Well, and as you mentioned in your presentation as well, we have also really long-term goals like CO2 emissions, and, and we also need to envision how we can, how does our future look like if we aim for those goals. Uh, so it's not only politics, it's also about uh, getting things done and uh, uh, imagine how this could work. Anyone else? Like some Pop up. Oh yes, there in the back. Oh, you walk over? Yeah, I'll walk over. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Much enjoyed. Um, so just a question about positivity and negativity in media and um, uh, artistic representations. Sometimes it's really uncool to present positive visions of the future. Um, you know, uh, science fiction novels that are about this like wonderful positive place is like, I mean, that's boring reading. Um, <laughs> and I, and in the arts also, I mean like, oh, I did this art project and it's about this really cool world we're gonna live in. It's like, pfft. is there some inherent tension around our um, entertainment value of negativity that could somehow get in the way of us putting the effort into positing the positive that we're trying to get to? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's a very good point. In science fiction novels, films, etc., you tend to see a more dystopian view of the future. But I think the flip side might be a problem in commercial activity. For instance, working in architecture offices, you actually have to paint a very positive vision of this future city or neighborhood or building that you want to produce because you have to sell it to people, right? So actually a lot of the projects I've worked on in the past are really having a selling function. You're trying to convince an investor or a municipality or someone to build the thing. So there's almost the inverse where you have to be overly positive and you know you're going to have the flying cars and it's all going to be great and everyone's going to make their food at home and I think it's um yeah there's maybe a balance between those two worlds like maybe they could learn from each other and I think Tessa made a really nice point before about co-creation being really important and that is probably the process to get towards more authentic visions of the future is rather than sort of one designer doing it for a client or one science fiction writer doing it for an audience is to just do it with people or let people do it themselves. Yeah, and maybe besides co-creation, I think iteration is really important. Um, and what you say in architecture, you already in the, in the first competition phase, you have to paint a picture of what the final result is going to be. And then the rest of the process, you're just like struggling to reach that process. Whereas, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's like one positive solution for a problem. You just kind of have to redirect and then reflect and then redirect again. And 
it kind of get to a better place eventually, maybe, but then at the same time create another problem that then you have to fix. Hopefully not. But yeah, it's an iterative co-creation process, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, I, do, I don't know where you are. Uh, Is in the I think. Okay. Uh, but look, um, I actually, on, it's not really true that only the dystopias are artistically cool. I mean, there is, uh, if you look at uh, contemporary sci-fi, there is a whole genre called solar punk that imagines a, a, a scenario, actually a future or some kind of reality in which, at least for certain, for certain things, things go really, really well. So I kind of disagree with the, with the premise. But uh, having said that, uh, again, I think that there is value in imagining something really awful. And there is value in uh, trying to design either a system that is in itself awful, it, just for the, you know, for, the, for the experience of doing this, because that can teach us something. Uh, or there could, there could also be another different type of value in imagining a reaction to a situation that is terrible. And also that can teach quite a lot to uh, design students and design practitioners and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think in a way embracing dystopias can be, can be productive, maybe not necessarily for, for selling something to a client, a client would never want a dystopia, uh, but um, or maybe they do, but <laughs> if so, I want to really meet that client because this person seems to be really cool. Uh, but uh, there is stuff to learn from that. So I think that we should not shy away from, from it. Ah, yeah, I, I wanted to add a question uh, from my vision of the future perspective, because can we also use speculative design for other social values, uh, like being connected with nature or being more, con more connected with each other and use public space for that? Is that also something you can imagine? How do you look? Can you imagine these other social values? It's a question for you as well. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that's um, essential. Uh, yeah, I do think we really need positive visions which are not sort of commercially oriented and are coming from the perspective of people who are going to be impacted by these issues, climate change, social inequality, etc. Um, something that people can resonate with. I think it's still very climate change and the impacts, yeah, often it's very dystopian or it's just hard to imagine, right? Like most people find it very hard to imagine 10 years into the future. Um, so I think offering and inviting these kind of processes to, to people is really essential, actually. I think anyone who's able to do that or kind of has a platform to do that should do it. Um. There was a really cool experiment, uh, I think, in Copenhagen, uh, well, quite a few years back. Uh, not necessarily from the world of architecture, but from the world of live-action role-playing games. So, uh, originally, way back, it was the lovely weirdos that would dress up as wizards and warriors and would do crazy stuff in, in the woods. Uh, but then, you know, the, the whole genre uh, sort of evolved, uh, and. Uh, I think in the early 2000s there was this uh, experimental piece called System Danmark uh, in which they imagined a, a scenario in which uh, I think there was some kind of social credit score that was used extremely aggressively and they uh, literally um, uh, set up uh, kind of a slum, uh, a possible, a possible uh, uh, reconstruction of a future slum uh, in which they asked uh, players slash actors to, to, to live in for a week, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, again, uh, this can be a particular kind of fun, maybe not exactly a popular fun, uh, but it can be a way f to imagine maybe kind of as a negative uh, but 
to imagine and to visualize and materialize and embody uh, how different ways of living could be. Again, good luck selling that to the city council. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think that this is something that we can learn from quite, uh, quite a lot. So I've got one my final question to round this panel discussion off. And uh, some of you have touched upon co-creation involving people. Um, so how do we make this not just a, a designer in-group thing, but how can we involve the actual people in a city or in a country or the world? How big do you take this? And how do you involve all these people? <laughs> So I think what is most important is that our cities remain places for people to design their lives in. Um, also the technology part of the city. And I think what happens a lot now is that um, the systems that we use are designed in such a kind of seamless way that we don't understand how it works and we only use a tiny part of it. And there's all these kind of back-end functions that we're not aware of. Um, so yeah, I would say keep it transparent and legible and relatable and in the end actionable so that everyone can use it to design their own future together. Nice. I'll say that those are great last words to round off this uh, panel discussion. Thank you very much to the panel, Alice, Tessa, Zeger, and Gabrielle. And now for the final closing, I'll just invite you yeah. back down to your seats here. Um, because we're going we're gonna to fi finish today, uh, end today, with our own sort of little imagining. Uh, and for that, we have brought Mitchell Samuel Gordon, uh, and he's a storyteller. Uh, welcome you to this. Where do you want to stand? Do you want to stand on the stage in front of the stage? Uh, right here. Great. Yeah. Um, just to introduce Mitchell, uh, he's a Surinamese fiction writer who specializes in short story thrillers with horror elements and religious themes. He works as a software tester in the IT world, but his heart is in writing. At primary school, he discovered his great love for it. It started with poems, but soon changed into fantasy, science fiction, and thriller stories. His goal is to become a pioneer within the thriller genre in the Netherlands with the book that he's working on. And as we learned at the start of the evening, he's also a student of the University of Applied Sciences here in Amsterdam. Um, and he's going to take us through a short story of his. Thank you. Can everyone uh, hear me? All right, so imagine, starting from tomorrow, you can share your most precious memory with a stranger. Like they can feel what you felt. They can, they can even see what you saw and even hear what you heard. Like no sense remains a secret any longer. Everyone, uh, close your eyes and open your mind to this new form of madness. It is time to think back. Can you smell the delicious herbs in your grandmother's dishes? Or perhaps do you taste the lips of an old love again? In the world I live in now, uncovering your heart is as normal as eating popcorn at the movies. But not for me. I don't feel anything anymore. With a painful gaze, I look out of the window of the train. A man with hollow eyes and dark back stares back at me. He seems more dead than alive. How can someone like him still feel love when it like keeps slipping through his fingers? With lump in my throat, I get off at Central Station. I start to wander around aimlessly. Anything is better than going back, right? Without realizing it, I stop in front of an electronic billboard. I press the screen. It's from the low system. It shows a route to a place called the Cure for broken people. But can they heal me there? 
My chest feels tight, but I decide to take the gamble. The route brings me to the National Monument on the dam. It's a 22 meter long concrete pylon, and there's a large crowd gathering around the statue. Their empty eyes and their wet cheeks say more than enough. They are so tired of being broken. I join them in silence. Hand in hand, we are waiting to be safe. Beneath the statue, several television screens start to flip up. They show us a couple of sentences. Welcome to the Losi system. Your emotional evolution begins today. Behind the doors of a memory palace lies your cure. Keep looking at the screen and we will take care of the rest. Breathe in and breathe out. We follow these instructions with outstretched arms. A spinning spiral appears on each screen and from the speaker comes the hum of a woman. It sounds like a laughing mother's lullaby. Our eyes grow weary from crying. The low system senses that and lulls us all into a deep slumber. I wake up, drenched in sweat, and there's no one left, only a sea of darkness and marble doors. Is this the memory palace? I carefully open its doors. On the other side waits a woman in a wedding dress. Suddenly, she pulls me inside. We are now in a greenhouse? No more marble doors to be seen, and no darkness either. Only flowers and the happy faces of family and friends, but I don't recognize anyone. I want to scream, but instead I smile. The woman wears the same bright red lipstick as Elisa my ex. I feel at ease. However, the voice in which I now sing my wedding vows is not mine. And the eyes uh, of the woman looking at me lovely are not of Elisa. But still, I feel so warm inside. The woman now says her wedding vows back to me and seals them with a kiss. I feel her love dancing on my lips. I wait and wait, but this time it doesn't slip through my fingers. With a smile, I wake up from the memory of a stranger and I look around. The woman is gone, but her love will remain with everyone in the crowd forever. She taught us to live again, to feel and this was our emotional evolution in the city of the, of the future. And now it's your turn. Open your eyes again, everyone. Open your eyes. It's time to imagine the unimaginable. Thank you, Mitchell. That signifies the end of this evening. Um, I'd like to ask Mari Lang with me, back on stage, I'll give you a microphone, uh, for some closing words. Yes, I, uh, I uh, really enjoyed this evening. I, I thought it was really very nice talks and very nice, uh, uh, well, a lot of new things I saw. Um, I would like uh, to thank you all, uh, especially the presenters. Uh, so maybe we can hand over some of the flowers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to uh, Troy already left, but I would like to um, to, to thank Tessa, uh, Alice, uh, and Tomo, uh, and Mitchell. Yeah, okay, great. And also, uh, of course, uh, Gabriele and uh, Zeger for their participation in the roundtable discussion. Oh, is it okay? 
<laughs> and of course, I also would love to thank the editorial team there over there, uh, Katie Bernard, uh, Jasper Bunschoten, and Pamela Nelson, who really uh, did a lot of things and helped also with the editorial part of the magazine. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this evening and hopefully we'll meet again in the future. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that really concludes the official part of this evening. Um, I'm told there are some drinks uh, that you can all stay, have a chat about what you learned today and have fun. Thank you. <laughs>